This week for EM in 5, we're going to talk about special seizures. Now, we all know how to manage your basic seizure. You give benzos, more benzos, intubate, give more benzos. Um, but these are seizures that don't respond to your standard treatments, so they're not going to respond to that first dose of benzodiazepines that you give the patient. So for lack of any better term, I'm just going to call them special seizures. So let's go through a couple examples. Your obvious one is going to be a young female coming in, first time ever seizure, didn't respond to the benzos that EMS gave her, and it turns out she's pregnant, probably has eclampsia. But what if it's not that obvious? What if it's a little hard to tell if the patient's pregnant? Or what if they're postpartum? You could have a young female show up and it could be that dad with the two-week-old newborn is on his way and you don't even realize that she's postpartum. So the definition for eclampsia is anytime you're greater than 20 weeks gestational age or four weeks postpartum. So it's really one of those diagnoses that you just have to think about. And if you have a young female who's of childbearing age that's not responding to your first dose of benzodiazepines, think about it. Could this be eclampsia? And your treatment here is going to be magnesium. You're going to give four to six grams load followed by a drip. All right, your next patient is really well known to the ER, comes in all the time intoxicated. But this weekend, his family's been in town and he hasn't been drinking as much as usual, and he comes in with a seizure, and EMS has hit him with a dose of benzos, and he's not responding to them. Now, the problem here is not actually your drug. It's the amount of drug that you're giving. Your dosing is all wrong. They need tons of benzos in order to control these seizures. In fact, Bellevue Hospital in New York that sees a lot of alcoholic patients did a study on this, and they saw that their alcohol withdrawal patients in the ICU were requiring huge doses of diazepam, up to 100 milligram doses. And they also saw that phenytoin is not that helpful. So their protocol there is that you do these escalating doses of diazepam until you can achieve symptomatic control. And the next thing they recommend after that is phenobarbital. And your goal with these patients is to titrate the benzodiazepines until you get their symptoms under control. So don't be scared of these large doses you're giving. Don't be worried about the number. What you want to do is titrate to the person in front of you. You want to have them nicely sedated, so not agitated, breathing normally, and with normal vital signs. So try to get that heart rate under 110. Okay, next patient comes in. This is a young female brought in from the dormitories of the university nearby having a seizure. And the roommate says that she's actually been on treatment for TB recently. So what are we dealing with here? She's not responding to benzos. Yeah, concerning for isoniazid toxicity. So this can cause seizures, pretty severe metabolic acidosis, altered mental status, and it occurs pretty quickly, around 30 minutes after ingestion, and it's not going to respond to benzos. You have to give the antidote, which here is pyridoxine. The isoniazid actually causes a pyridoxine deficiency, which has an effect on GABA receptors, so you need to give pyridoxine in order to stop the seizures. Another thing to think about is electrolyte abnormalities, and one of the big ones I th always think about is hyponatremia, and this can be pretty scary. So patients at risk of seizures from hyponatremia are those with a sudden drop or sodium less than 120, and hyponatremia is tough to handle. You don't want to cause an osmotic demyelination by correcting them too fast, but the one time that you have the go-ahead to use hypertonic saline is when they have altered mental status or they're seizing, and that's our patient here. So you want to give them hypertonic 3% saline until they stop seizing. Another one we think about a lot is hypocalcemia. These patients can prevent with seizures, and maybe you have a recent history of a lot of muscle spasms or tetany, and you can see on the EKG that they have a long QT. That might actually cue you into what's going on before you even get the labs back. So if this is a concern, you're going to treat them with calcium, and you can actually watch that QT shorten right after you give it to them. Another one is hypomagnesemia. Again, it can cause seizures, tetany, hyperreflexia, arrhythmias. Treatment is to give a mag. Uh, just make sure you don't do it too fast or you might cause apnea. One other thing to think about is different infections or mass lesions that could be causing the seizure. Now, who's at risk for that? HIV patients and also those in the developing world. In fact, neurosister psychosis is the most common cause of provoked seizure in the developing world. So if you have one of these patients, they're having seizures, you need to look a little further. You are going to actually treat them with benzodiazepines, but you need to figure out why they're having seizures because you can't miss this. They might need a CT head, maybe an LP. They might need antibiotics or antivirals in order to really treat the true cause. So next time you have a patient come in and they're not responding to that first or second dose of benzodiazepines, think to yourself, is this one of those special seizures? Because if you're not looking for it, you'll miss it. Are they young female of childbearing age? Could they have electrolyte abnormalities? Are they being treated for TB? Are they an alcoholic? Or are they one of your high-risk populations? Here's some references, and thanks for joining us this week on EM in 5.